Thanks, William. Um, so, yep, my name is Chad Johnson. I'm in the faculty with the Computing and New Media Technologies Department for the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, one of my uh, special research interests here, uh, which is stylometry. And if you're not familiar with what that is now, um, I'm glad you're here because you're sure to be hearing a lot more about it in the future because this is essentially how we can detect who authored what text in an era when um, we're not really sure what misinformation campaigns might be out there that we might see online. So this actually uh, goes back to an idea that started out long ago when the internet was still fairly young, right? Uh, so Peter Steiner uh, drew a cartoon uh, for the New Yorker in 1993. You can see it right here. It's just a couple of dogs, and one of them is telling the other, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. Now, it's silly, uh, but actually that cartoon speaks to uh, what was one of the more profound promises of the fledgling internet. I mean, fledgling for consumers in 1993, anyway. Uh, and that is that the internet is a place where your identity outside of it shouldn't really matter, right? Uh, it's a place where ideas can go stand on their own merits. And it doesn't really matter if the message is being delivered by somebody uh, who's young or what their gender is or their race is. It, uh, it was just about the idea and everyone else could see it and adjudicate accordingly. Um, it was going to be a utopia, right? Well, of course, that isn't exactly how things worked out. Um, it turns out we bring a lot of that baggage with us everywhere we go. Um, and so while I would say, and this is just from a cyber sociological perspective, while I would say that having this marketplace of ideas has served to homogenize a lot of our culture and ideas, uh, we still have a lot of infighting over these various different aspects of our personas outside of the internet uh, that just really don't matter. But another reason that it didn't really work out the way that we had all hoped in the early 90s is because it turns out that that perceived anonymity that comes with identity flexibility on the internet uh, is really easy to abuse. Um, so we see people all the time who take advantage of that situation with catfishing, I said the misinformation campaigns that are out there, attempting to manipulate the zeitgeist and get their message out, suppress messages they disagree with. Uh, and of course, cybercrime is always uh, perpetuated through a veil of anonymity. And there's a lot of people who engage in cybercrime um, for, because for various reasons they feel it's safer than engaging in offline crime, right? It's something that they wouldn't normally do, but the uh, perceived anonymity that veil... Uh, gives them, um, it makes them opportunistic, right, in that regard. Now, um, of course, back in the early 90s, uh, virtually everything that happened on the internet was all going to be text-based. There was, of course, images and some multimedia out there for the internet at that time, um, but for the most part, it was mostly textual. And then uh, throughout the early 2000s, with the proliferation of broadband access, we have begun seeing more images and streaming video and that kind of a thing. But text still remains the largest portion of communication on the internet and probably will forever just because it's so flexible and simple and easy. Um, I don't really think there's ever going to be a time when we're going to reach that uh, Starship Troopers or Star Trek type level where everything is done via video chat. I, I just I don't see it being you know something that really takes over, um, at least not anytime soon. So that brings us to stylometry and forensic linguistics. So what stylometry is, is it is the systematic analysis of text. And what we do is we analyze that for statistical markers, which could be attributed to behaviors or demographics or unique linguistic styles that help us to identify an author. Uh, so in that case, we would do that for authorship attribution, but we will also do stylometry uh, for the purposes of author characterization and verification. And we'll talk about the distinction of those uh, in just a moment. Uh, but the assumption underlying with stylometry and has been meted out uh, over the years of research is that there is an invariance in authorship. So an author will have certain distinctive characteristics and writing habits, idiosyncrasies uh, that are exhibited in their writing across time and across various bodies of work. Uh, and that's to one degree or another. 
Now, uh, it should be noted that stylometry is distinct from forensic linguistics. They're often done together. Um, but whereas forensic linguistics is more of a behavioral analysis, stylometry is statistical analysis of that text. And the best distinction uh, that I can make as far as an analogy goes is when you're doing uh, analysis of image evidence. Uh, forensic linguistics would be like a facial comparison analysis, and stylometry would be more like facial recognition analysis. So what can we hope to get out of stylometry as far as being used in official investigative capacities? Um, well, at this point, uh, stylometry has been around since the 1890s, um, and there has been a lot of research. There was a lot of breakthroughs in the early 70s uh, with some, er some researchers in the subject when computers were new, and there was this idea that uh, we would no longer have to do computations like this by hand. Um, and since then, there have been more and more work. And of course, uh, recently, with the, the newfound attention on um, authorship attribution and uh, malware code and that kind of a thing, um, we're seeing more and more ink being spilled on the subject. But that said, um, the science and law um, are worlds that take a long time to meet sometimes. Um, and so what we have here is a case where stylometry is fairly well grounded in research, but not necessarily in legal precedent. So uh, there have been very few determinations on admissibility in courts, and we have to take into account that text appears in a lot of different places <clears throat> and in a lot of different forms. So even if we were to get admissibility, for, the, for, ex for example, somebody will take the stand uh, and attest to stylometric evidence uh, and they pass the Dolbert test, um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it would automatically be admitted next time because text can appear everywhere in a lot of different ways. So it would kind of be on a case by case basis for, for quite some time. So it is used in investigations, uh, just not as direct evidence. It is used mostly for disambiguation. So you have a, a you know, a subject pool and you're looking for, um, to, to whittle down uh, a, a list of potential subjects. Um, so they can be considered investigative leads uh, at this point, but not necessarily evidence. However, hopefully by the end of this, you'll agree it's, uh, it's fairly strong indicators. Uh, so to begin, I'd like to uh, tell you about the quintessential case study in stylometry. Uh, if you're not familiar with the Federalist Papers, of course, they are 85 documents that were written around the time of the American Revolution, and we had three authors later on. Of course, they were published anonymously in their time, uh, but later on, after the war, uh, those authors were discovered. Um, so there's 85 papers, and five of them are attributed to John Jay, and his authorship is not really in dispute, uh, but the rest of the papers were written by Alexander Hamilton and James Madison. Um, the crux of the problem that we have here is that prior to his death and his famous duel, Alexander Hamilton wrote a letter, and after his death, it was opened, and it was found that Alexander Hamilton claimed authorship of 63 of the 85 Federalist Papers. Uh, which was a problem for James Madison because he uh, disputed that and attested to um, uh, authoring 12 of those and then co-authoring another three after that. Um, the problem that we had, or the problem I should say that, that uh, in authorship attribution at the time, of course, it was a dead man's word versus a living man's word. Um, and uh, anybody who was attempting to analyze the texts had a lot of problems with it because, of course, these were three authors, they were contemporary, they had similar education backgrounds, they lived in a similar time, in a similar culture, and they were writing on identical topics. So we had an issue, you know, how do we whittle out who is who? Well, many, many years later, 150 years later, as a matter of fact, uh, we were able to finally get to a point where we could run solid statistical stylometric analysis on the Federalist Papers, and it was determined fairly conclusively, I think with 99% accuracy, uh, that uh, Madison was vindicated, that he did in fact write those 12 and mostly author, not just co-author, uh, the other three that were in dispute, uh, which of course still leaves Hamilton with the lion's share of the Federalist Papers at 50, uh, but certainly vindicates Ham uh, Madison and the work that he, he contributed to, to those. Now the crux of the, uh, the issue there for Hamilton, uh, of course, is that uh, what we found when we look at the, the analysis of the Federalist Papers is Hamilton's downfall is that he had a very particular writing style in that he would never use a common word when an uncommon word would do. I can give you a more recent example uh, as well. Uh, in 2013, a book called The Cuckoo's Calling was released by a supposed, a supposed first-time author, Robert Galbraith. 
uh, Patrick uh, Juola with the computer science department at uh, Dickensia University uh, did a stylometric analysis when word got out that uh, Robert Galbraith was actually a pen name for another well-known author. So in his analysis, he compared uh, uh, five Yes, five uh, other well-known authors with a large body of work, and the only one that had any statistical correlation with the text was Harry Potter writer J.K. Rowling. And then word leaked, uh, someone close to J.K. Rowling or J.K. Rowling's attorney um, accidentally leaked the information, and eventually J.K. Rowling did come clean and admit that Robert Galbraith was her pseudonym and the Cougar's Calling was hers. So some of the tools that we use when we're doing a stylometric analysis is uh, we will use, there's there's very few uh, suites out there that are dedicated, written for the purpose. This isn't going to be a feature that you're going to find in NCASE or um, a forensic toolkit or anything like that. Uh, what you're looking for are tools that are usually for data analytics, um, and there are some that do have uh, some some modules that are written for stylometric analysis. Uh, Signature is a very old standalone program. Uh, it doesn't have a lot of the features that you're really going to want to use, but it is out there if you want to use it just for sort of basic uh, basic analysis of, of bodies of text. Uh, there is JGAP, the Java Graphical Authorship Attribution Project, uh, JStylo, uh, which is from Drexel University, and they also do JSAN, which is the opposite of that. It is an authorship anonymizing software. The big one uh, right now that uh, that I've been using mostly is our stylo, uh, which means you're going to, of course, need to have our studio and, and get that all set up. But it's a very, very nice suite. In addition to that, there are plenty of bodies of text out there for you to analyze or for your comparison. If you have an author that you, you want to try to run a stylometric analysis on, uh, there is the Cognitive Effective Personality System. There is the Twitter corpus. And Google has tons of corpus out there for both American English, British English, and so on. So what are you going to need if you're going to do this? Well, you're going to need to gather a large corpus of text, authors known and or unknown. Uh, raw text is going to be better than anything formatted. If you can strip out all the the, uh, the fonts and the sizing and all of that good stuff, uh, you don't need that. This is going to be a statistical analysis. We're not doing any kind of behavioral analysis of the text. Um, the more source material you have to analyze, the more confident your results are more likely to be. Um, and it's always best to get, find material that was written outside of the context of any investigation. So if you are conducting an investigation, asking somebody would they write you a term paper or something to analyze uh, after the fact is not, not really the best because the uh, adversarial stylometry is when somebody will uh, attempt to obfuscate their authorship of a piece and then you have to try and figure out um, you know the the remaining artifacts that aren't destroyed from that um, and you don't want to give someone the opportunity to to do that if you can avoid it um, you also want to, if you're going to be trying to determine the authorship uh, in particular where authorship is questioned, you want to make sure that the original author is available in the comparison. So in the stylometric analysis of the cuckoo's calling that Ju uh, Juola did, um, if uh, that data set did not include J.K. Rowling or if that data set didn't include the actual author, um, it would have still shown one of the authors to, to have a statistical relevance or could have, I should say, shown one of the authors to have a statistical uh, correlation with that, that work. But if the actual author is not in there, of course, there won't be any stronger signals uh, to, to override all of that uh, coincidental correlation. Yep. Um, what we're looking at here is your results. This is statistics, right? So it's not going to be conclusive, but what you will get is a certainty based upon apparent similarity. So it's much like a facial recognition system. If you run a uh, face through a facial recognition system database, you will get some results back, but that doesn't mean that it is conclusive that it is that person. It just means that you have a group of subjects in your database that happen to have a lot of very similar markers and will still require manual analysis after that. So what you're looking for when you're doing stylometric analysis, there's actually many ways to approach this. So there's a lot of different ways uh, to uh, to approach uh, your analysis. You can do so by looking just at the raw language, uh, at the lexicon, the phraseology, or the linguistic persona. So the language is going to be looking at the text from the the raw. Um, the raw architecture, the, uh, the the building blocks, right? What actually makes up the text specifically. So you're looking at 
not within context or anything like that. You're not looking at the substance. You're looking at the most common words, the letter frequency, the various different parts of speech. You're looking for engrams, the number of typos and misspellings, uh, and uh, how many times words are repeated, right? This is just the, the language as a raw, what makes up that text very specifically, as if you're breaking it down into its basic component colors, almost. Lexicon gets you a little bit closer to uh, getting to what the author is like specifically as a writer. Um, so what you're looking at there are what are known as, for example, lemmas, uh, which are going to be individual words, non-conjugated, uninflected, uh, no proper nouns, no idioms, just the raw words. So we wouldn't say uh, we wouldn't say help or um, we would use help rather, not helpless. Uh, we wouldn't use ran. We would use run, that kind of a thing. Um, and uh, that's fairly distinctive about an author's uh, previous experience, uh, not just their education, but also, for example, um, vocations and hobbies, uh, because a lot of the words that we learn are ones that we pick up along our way and our journey. So we'll find that on the low end, an English speaker um, that doesn't have a lot of experience or education may have as few as 27,000 lemmas. Uh, on average, though, people will have about 40,000. Um, the very uh, well experienced or, or worldly among us uh, may have close to 50,000, uh, but we all kind of end up about that place when we are in our, our, our late 60s and 70s at that point. Anyway, we've lived long enough, we've heard enough words, uh, you know, it's kind of passed by us. Uh, we'll take a look at those words and we will try to arrange them by lexical tiers, which is this here. Just breaking down those words into where do they belong? Where do they come from? Right. So we have tier one words, which are those known by almost everybody, usually used by by children, uh, people who don't have a lot of education, you know, just basic, simple, everyday words that everybody knows. Dog run, breakfast, money. Uh, tier two will be average words common for adults. Right. Prefer a company benefit taxes. Uh, three is the rare words, um, so those that are used in specific locations, specific hobbies, endeavors, such as academia, um, uh, so carburetor, angioplasty, taxidermy, bora, as I've used a couple of times. Uh, and tier four are your uncommon loan words from other languages, and we separate these out because, of course, as English speakers, we we probably have a an exposure to a fair amount of uh, of foreign words, just as it's just part of our language here, right? Uh, we we use a lot of foreign loan words in English, um, but still, if you know uh, if you know what um, uh, mia culpa is. Uh, if you know what Rensmea means, if you know, you know, all these foreign words that kind of creep into our language, it can kind of give you a hint as to where you've been. And the last one uh, is the tier five words. We call these archaic words because they're not often used anymore. Um, so black, blackguard, uh, wherefore, maladroit, they just don't use them very often anymore in English. Uh, we'll also examine uh, the lexicon for Argo. Argo is going to be your slang, jargon, uh, cant. Uh, it's basically language that's particular to a group. Uh, it's often used as a boundary maintenance mechanism, so outsiders can't understand or don't understand what's going on. Uh, we look for hapax legomena, which are words that appear only once in a given text, which is basically they're incredibly rare words within the corpus. Um, and uh, so if you see it in one if you see it in your data set and then you see it in your suspect or subjects uh, uh, suspected authorship, that's a very strong corollary. It only appears once. The, the only person to use it in the entire corpus, for example. Uh, and then we're also looking for synonym counts. So we keep really long lists of words that can be used as synonyms because the more synonyms that we see appear in a text, it's a great indicator of uh, language versatility, precision, um, and, uh, and flexibility, right? So if somebody has many different synonyms for the same word we can uh, assume generally if you picked up on this uh, that uh, if somebody can describe something in very specific terms well then their language tends to be more precise than somebody who just uses well this is good for everything right uh, phraseology really gets us to the stylistic choices as far as authorship goes uh, we're also looking for things that really make them stand out as authors. So we're looking for uh, things like idiosyncrasies. So do they capitalize uh, words to emphasize them or do they italicize them? Do they use punctuation properly or do they use it in a particular way? Um, I tend to use dashes uh, where ellipses will do, but 
that's just me. Um, and I don't think most authors know how to really use a semicolon. So that's something that often stands out too. Uh, we're also looking for uh, syntax, uh, anal uh, syntax words. Um, so word agreement, grammar tense. We're looking for words that may date a text as well. So for example, if, uh, if the word computer appears, uh, in a text, well, it couldn't have been written. I mean, I should say if a word computer appears in the context of a computer, uh, as it does today, then it couldn't have been written before the advent of the computer. <clears throat> um, we're looking for also prosodic features. Um, so the, the, uh, aspects of the text that give away emotional state or mood, um, that kind of a thing. Um, we're looking for figurative language, so somebody who uses a lot of idioms, parables, metaphors. I'm guilty of this. I use a lot of idioms in my speech. I don't use it so much in my writing, but it's still pretty prevalent there as well. And all of this is to work up to an idiolectic profile, uh, which uh, is basically uh, speech patterns that are specific to a specific person or writing patterns that are specific to a, a specific person or colloquialisms that may, uh, may betray their... Um, general um, region where they grew up, um, and sometimes their chronological uh, characteristics as well, because slang changes, colloquialisms will also change. And finally, when it comes to their linguistic persona, uh, what we're looking for now are those behavioral traits uh, that we want to pass off for linguistic analysis, uh, I should say for forensic linguistic analysis. So we're looking for uh, things like their schema, so their, their personality that specifically comes through, uh, usually based upon the big five personality factors. You can basically evaluate somebody in person. You could do so with writing as well. Um, it's not going to be definitive for, uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but it will show which characteristics are apparent uh, in their text. So for example, there's a tool that you can use that will look through a person's Twitter feed and will run a big five personality uh, assessment of their writing. Um, so you may run it on one person. You'll see that they have a, a lot of anger uh, in their tweets. They use a lot of bold words and they're a lot of fighting words, whereas somebody else may have, you know, more of an open sort of um, uh, appearance in their in their Twitter um, Twitter feed. Um, and I'm, I'm running short on time, so I'm going to quickly go through this. Um, so, yes, we're looking for their, their life experience, what makes them, you know, what, what of them specifically as an artist is in the text. Uh, and what can we glean about, uh, you know, what, what their domains might possibly be, right? If, especially if it's going to be a criminal investigation. Uh, do we have a lot of signs that they may be familiar with counter forensics? Uh, do we have signs that they may, you know, be familiar with mechanics or, or whatever uh, happens to be in there? Uh, we're also looking for message symmetry. Um, so uh, from a sociable standpoint, if we're looking at, for example, social media, what is their uh, contact uh, ratio? How often are they communicating? How long are they communicating? How long does it take them to respond? Uh, that kind of a thing. All right, so for analysis methods, uh, pretty much every uh, major paper uh, lately will be either some variation of the Burroughs Delta or something very similar to it. So the Burroughs Delta is developed a very, very long time ago in a series of texts questioning authorship uh, from the 1970s, uh, which was, as I mentioned before, when computers really started to get involved. So that's when things really started to pick up with stylometric analysis. Um, essentially what the delta is, is it's a way to normalize text by identifying those patterns um, and uh, trying to find and correlate similarities. So what you're doing with a Burroughs delta is you are looking for uh, linguistic features such as engrams or other features that can be used to correlate other things. And keeping in mind, of course, uh, that this is all statistical analysis, so we are only dealing in probabilities. Uh, we're never going to reach absolute certainty here, just as we won't with uh, any sort of statistical analysis. Even, even DNA is only 99 point whatever uh, percent certain. So some of the other features in addition to n-grams, n-grams uh, are, are features that appear uh, in close proximity to each other. So you may have bigrams, so there may be letters um, or, uh, or words that appear very close to each other, trigrams and so on. Uh, you may also be looking for, uh, you know, the number of sentences beginning with proper capitalization, number of words, sentences, or paragraphs as a whole, average word length, uh, which was also useful in the Federalist Papers analysis. Um, 
because it's very stark. You can see uh, if you compare John Jay's with Madison or Hamilton, John Jay was very terse, used very uh, short words, didn't have very long sentences, didn't have very long paragraphs. He was very, very bold to the point, uh, succinct, whereas Hamilton and uh, Madison were a lot more prosaic, a lot more loquacious, and uh, and... Um, so yes, uh, also things, you know, like prefixing their sentences, however, likewise, therefore, um, filler words like, well, you know, um, and the use of function words, uh, all of these are, are things that can be latched onto as a particular statistic in a text. Um, so an example of where this came up is uh, in the, uh, the Unabomber case. Uh, with Ted Kaczynski had written a manifesto and sent it off very famously, uh, Industrial Society and Its Future, and the uh, Janet Reno, the then district, uh, sorry, then Attorney General, uh, pushed to have this published, which turned out to be a good idea because, of course, we know Ted Kaczynski's brother recognized the writing style and turned his brother in. But even if he hadn't, there would have still been a strong correlation with Ted Kaczynski anyway, because after analyzing that manifesto, we found certain idiosyncrasies in the writing. So, uh, for example, just in terms of the substance of the, uh, 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 sorry, the contextual analysis of the of the document, it was written on a typewriter rather than a computer. Um, he tended to have certain idiosyncrasies, like capitalizing entire words to show emphasis, um, always referring to himself in the third, in, sorry, as we or Freedom Club, uh, which may have been a ploy to make it seem as if he wasn't working alone, but, you know, it may also have been revealing of a personality trait. Um, using irregular spelling, hyphenation, and archaic forms of idioms, uh, and specifically, well, we probably know the idiom as you can't have your cake and eat it too that's the way it's uh, it's become known uh where actually the correct usage uh, original of the idiom is you can't uh keep uh, eat your cake and have it too so the other way around Um, so when this comes to forensic stylometry and computers, uh, unfortunately, we often don't have the luxury of having a large corpus of text, right? We don't have uh, the the series of Harry Potter books to compare to a single text. Instead, what we usually end up with in terms of uh, internet uh, investigations, uh, social media posts, or code, um, but luckily we can kind of do some things to make this work for that as well. So we use short message stylometry for uh, high frequency, low content sources of text, like your social media posts, chat messages, SMS, email, um, and code stylometry is something very specific for the analysis of code. There are certain markers that appear uh, within uh, programmers. Programmers have distinctive styles as it happens. So with code stylometry, uh, there's been a lot of promise here. To show you how fast things have uh, progressed with code stylometry over the last few years, in uh, 2011, researchers at the University of Wisconsin created a program that was able to attribute authorship in different scenarios uh, with a great deal of uh, relative certainty, right? So in a comparison of 10 different authors, their accuracy rate was 81%, but between 200 authors was 51%, which is still very good good, um, but obviously room for improvement there. Well, only a few years later, um, four years later, as a matter of fact, uh, researchers were able to write a program uh, that was able to uh, adjudicate authorship between 1,600 authors with 94% accuracy. And doing this by analyzing certain aspects of the code that weren't considered in the 2011 study, uh, such as uh, the use of white space uh, and, of course, tabs versus spaces. I know that's a subject that a lot of programmers will, will that's the hill that they'll die on, I know. Um, the naming of variables is another one. There's a lot of opinion when it comes to these kinds of things. Um, and certain and programming languages, they, are, they tend to be flexible enough that they allow you to make these choices. I'm, I mean, other than, of course, I'm looking at you, Python. But other than that, uh, you know, usually it's, it's just fine. It's all entirely up to the author. Uh, it's become so reliable um, that... Uh, um, the uh, U.S. intelligence services have begun using code stylometry, for example, for the analysis of malware, able to determine in 2014 that the Sony Pictures attack was uh, sponsored by North Korea due to the Shamoon malware, which was used in, in North, uh, sorry, South Korea ba banks and broadcasting companies uh, the year before.
Uh, and uh, yes, I see that, yes, uh, certain things that you do to uh, code will remove some of the programmer styles. And of course, if you're working, you're working with compiled code, uh, a lot of it's going to depend on whether or not the binary is stripped or unstripped or what kind of decompiler you have. And there's a lot of different factors there. Uh, yes, uh, but under the conditions of their, of their uh, study, this is the, the level of accuracy they were able to achieve. All right, so earlier I said that we used stylometry for attribution characterization and verification. So the difference between those uh, when, we call, when we talk about uh, short message stylometry, of course, attribution is where we have a list of known authors, a corpus, a body of text, and we have an unknown an, un an unknown subject uh, message, and we want to see which author could it possibly belong to. Uh, characterization uh, works a little bit differently where we have a group of messages with known characteristics and then messages from an unknown author and characterization is essentially uh, speech language diagnostics in reverse so speech language pathologists will bring in a patient and they'll do an evaluation of their language skills in order to determine whether or not there is some kind of uh, developmental or language disorder at play they'll essentially bring in somebody who maybe should have the vocabulary of a third grader and if they instead have the vocabulary of a kindergartner, well then they know that there may be an issue here that needs to be worked out. Well, what we do with characterization is actually the reverse of that. We have a body of text, we analyze that to see what markers it should have, and then correlate demographics with that. So we can determine somebody, uh, you know, for example, we have a body of text, we can say that this was most likely written by somebody who has a fourth grade grasp of language, um, has, you know, familiarity with uh, the Pacific Northwest, and so on and so forth. Uh, verification is when we have a uh, corpus of known messages from the same author and a suspect message from that author. So we know who the author should be and we know the author's other works and we can run analysis on both of those to see if the suspected message fits in with the rest of the body of work or whether or not it's an outlier. And uh, this is something that's been done, of course, with uh, the authorship uh, disputes over uh, the works of William Shakespeare. Um, which is where a lot of early stylometric analysis came from. We have a lot of work by uh, William Shakespeare. We have a lot of works that we suspect most likely were written by him, but how do we verify that? Well, we can run a statistical analysis on it uh, and verify compared to the other authors who we also have bodies of work for. It's, uh, it's much closer to Shakespeare's than anybody else. Uh, I can give you uh, another real world case study here. This is one that I personally worked on uh, over the last summer, uh, international drug trafficking case. Uh, there were many different subjects involved. Uh, we were analyzing 55,866 decrypted text messages from 13 different devices. So all of these were PGP encrypted messages that were going through a secure server. The secure server happened to be operated by law enforcement. And so we were able to gather all of those messages. Uh, when the arrests occurred, 12 of the devices were seized and tied to subjects, but one device was missing, and that person had far more messages than anybody else. And from the content of the messages seemed to be the shot caller. Um, there was some suspicion that either the person uh, uh, who owned that device, either the device hasn't been recovered uh, because it was disposed of, uh, or it was rec wasn't recovered because it belongs to an individual who at that point was not uh, on when it was not arrested with everybody else. Uh, but um, there was other reason to believe that uh, that one of the other 12 was actually using that device is just separately, right? They were essentially using it as a separate device to kind of throw law enforcement off the trail. So the question is, is that unsub one of our current subjects? Is it another subject that's somewhere out there? Um, or, you know, uh, what could possibly be the story here? So um, essentially what we ended up with in that case is we found that, uh, that statistically uh, the two subjects uh, were most likely uh, using that device more than anything. So the shot caller was actually two individuals um, with, uh, with a fair degree to certainty. Two of our subjects, one and eight in this case, um, had uh, the, the strongest correlation with uh, those messages. And since there were two authors, it uh, also accounted for the increased sociability, right? There were tons more messages uh, at all hours of the night. So if there are two people using that number, you can expect roughly twice as many messages most of the time. I've got one final little trick uh, here before I'm, I'm done for today, and I'll go back up here and look at your questions. Um, I said before that what we really want with stylometric analysis is we want uh, standardized, unformatted, raw text. Um, however, um, 
it can be kind of cool if you do have access to the original text, however it happens to be, because the typography that's chosen is another deliberate choice by the author, and it can be pretty interesting what that can reveal as well. So if we look at a couple of memes, uh, what we have here are two memes with text on them, and the text appears to be Roboto, which is the uh, default font for Android systems. So we can say most likely uh, that these were developed on a, uh, a Android device, a mobile device, um, or something like that. Uh, either that or a system that happened to have Roboto installed, but that's far less likely than simply being an Android system. However, uh, when looking at these, there's actually a little bit of a tell here in that they are not actually the same character set. This isn't the same font set. They just appear to be at first blush. If we look really close, we can see that there's actually a difference in the capital R. You see here on the from, right? You can see that the R has a little bit of a squiggle there on the end of it. Well, as it happens, um, the character set that we have for Roboto in the English-speaking world for devices that are configured to use English as default, it uses a newer updated character set than the version of Roboto that is present on devices that don't use English as its default language. And if we do a little bit of a digging, we can see that there's Yatranamab, which is, uh, which I probably butchered the name, uh, which is actually a, uh, a, a form of Roboto that was developed for uh, devices that are in um, um, India, right, um, or, or South Asia. So what most likely we have here are two memes. Uh, both of them developed on an Android system, but the one here on the right uh, developed by a user of an Android system in India who is using this as their normal default character set, but converted it to English so that they could share it on the Internet. Uh, okay, that's it then for me. I'll, I'll go ahead and take your questions and uh, see if we... I can answer some of them. The end. The ends of the fonts are called ligatures, yes, uh, and there's also serifs, which would be the little fancy flourishes that you see on certain fonts. Roboto is a sans serif font, so there are no serifs to point out there. Uh, so when we're doing a stylometric analysis, we'll strip them out, but they are still significant. Uh, it's just that they're not significant to stylometric analysis. We're actually broaching a different subject known as semiotics, uh, which is the study of symbols and symbology and how they're used in communication, which is really interesting because we use them so much these days, um, and we kind of use them interchangeably with language, but they're they're actually... Uh, they're actually not language in so much as we're analyzing them with stylometry. Because when we're, when we're talking about semiotics, we're talking about the significance of, uh, of images, right? So if uh, <laughs> emojis are highly open to interpretation and very much require a shared culture in order to understand them, just as we have difficulty understanding hieroglyphics these days without putting ourselves within the context in which they were written, if I were to receive, and I do often receive texts from my teenage stepdaughter, I don't understand what it means because I have no relation at all to that culture. I have to try and parse it all out. But if I, if she gets one, it's just a string of pictures and she says, oh no, it's this says, you know, we'll meet you down at the park at six and bring some pizza, you know, like, I, <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it is. So it is, uh, it is significant to analyze them, but it's a completely different context. It's a different, different uh, moment of communication. It would be uh, more similar akin again to, to something like hieroglyphics, some kind of pictographs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, it definitely does. So when there's uh, when there's multiple authors, that is something that's potentially detectable. There has been a lot of stylometric analysis, for example, of religious texts to help sort out uh, the different time periods at which you know rewrites may have been made, uh, that kind of a thing. And it certainly does muddy the waters when we're talking about somebody else reading uh, something that somebody else wrote. Uh, that said, most speech writers uh, will will make an effort to try to capture the the voice or to create a voice for the for this person. But yes, in that case, what we would really rather take a look at uh, is some of their their own candid personal writing than something somebody wrote for them yeah yes yes that said however uh, former president uh, Trump was a very prolific user of Twitter uh, and uh, doing analysis on, on his tweets, which from, by and large apparently written directly by him and sent by him uh, was was very interesting yeah Well, uh, it depends. Uh, the more distinctive a person's writing style, the less text you need, uh, obviously. Uh, but uh, it also depends on what you want to achieve. In this case, where you have uh, an unknown author and you're trying to attribute it to, to an individual, uh, you usually need at least a decent amount of text, generally like around 15,000 words or so, if you can, if you can acquire that much. Um, but if you're going to be uh, doing it in a different, if you're characterizing the author instead, um, then it would be, uh, you need less from that author, but you need a larger corpus of data. So for example, we could take something like those one or two sentences, and instead of trying to compare them against um, maybe uh, corporate documents that have been produced by that individual, uh, we maybe instead could run it against the Twitter corpus and get an idea more about the character of the person, which would of course narrow them down as well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, in that case, you know, if we're if we're just characterizing the author, we may not be able to say definitively, you know, William wrote this, uh, but we would be able to run it against a corpus of other authors and say, well, the person who wrote this uh, is most likely male, most likely within this age range, most likely within this ethnicity, uh, and get fairly specific. And of course, always the more we have, the better, because it's statistical analysis. So we only get more certain as that probability gets closer and closer to one. Yep, and, and Zoom like we're using today, it archives all of the logs and chat history and everything. That's great. It's a yeah, it's something of an occupational hazard. Yeah, I mean, I, I've uh, been really involved in uh, digital forensics and and computer investigations for a while, so yeah, there's that tendency. You know, I kind of kind of hard to turn off sometimes. I uh, I usually get over it. I, I like to do uh, uh, puzzles with the family whenever I get a chance. These uh, they they have these uh, subscription order escape room boxes where there's all kinds of like cool puzzles and stuff in them. So it keeps you busy. Yeah, that's actually a good question. So, so do you, does your writing and your, does your voice in speaking and your voice in writing, do they match up? Uh, and the answer is, it really kind of depends. It depends on the sort of uh, communicator you are. There are some people uh, that are, are very uh, good at finding the right words off the cuff. They, they have an easy time communicating and, and just kind of 
you know, speaking directly to people. Um, and there are those that don't. Those that don't generally are better writers, and you'll find a more truer voice in their written words than you will in their spoken words. Um, and uh, yeah, so some people, uh, it's very similar, and some people, it's very distinct. And I, I also happen to be one of those people where it's, it's very distinct. Uh, if if you give me a, give me a moment to think about what I want to say, I'll find I'll find just the right way I want to say it. But speaking like this, I have no idea what's going to come out of my mouth next. Yeah, thanks for joining me, everybody. Have a good day.